welcome back to Take a Side, presented by Sided Debates. We've got a great show for you today, but before we get started with our show, be sure to get on to Sided.co or the Sided Debates app to post, comment, and vote on Engage with Other Users on the site to climb up that leaderboard for a chance at winning that $25 Amazon gift card. The more interaction your debate can get, the more points you earn, inching you closer to that top prize. Moving into our first debate, we have to discuss the Super Bowl last night between the Los Angeles Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals. The Rams came out victorious, beating the Bengals 23-20 after a Cooper Cup touchdown in the final minute and a half of the game. Both of these teams approached building their Super Bowl rosters very differently. The Bengals chose the rebuild route, drafting players over time and keeping them in their building to develop, as well as picking up one or two free agent signings. Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Jesse Bates are all players the Bengals drafted that have immediately produced for them, where they have signed free agent Trey Hendrickson this offseason, and he had his career high in sacks this year. The Rams, on the other hand, built their Super Bowl champion roster by trading for their big stars and spending on free agents. This really started three years ago when the Rams traded two first-round picks for cornerback Jalen Ramsey. This past offseason, they spent three first-round picks on quarterback Matt Stafford, as well as picking up Von Miller from the Broncos midseason and grabbing Odell Beckham Jr. after he was released in Week 11. I am joined by Kyle Mathis and Carson Shea to debate which team building strategy is better. Kyle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um... Hi guys, my name is Kyle, joined by Carson here. Um, today we're going to debate who had the better building process to make it to the Super Bowl, the Bengals or the Rams. Um, Carson, I'll let you start. You're on the side of the Rams, so yes, what, do, what do you think here? Well, I think that the Rams have the better building style here. Uh, right away, they won. They got Matthew Stafford. They sent all those picks away. They got Von Miller. I think they just wanted the win now mindset, and that's exactly what happened. All that matters is that they won the Super Bowl this year. I don't think what matters in the future. I think right now they won the Super Bowl. So that's my mindset here. So you, you don't think that um, the, the fans are going to be upset if they have to wait another 22 years like they had to in between the St. Louis Super Bowl and the L.A. Super Bowl? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd just like to say the Bengals have never won, so at least the Rams fans can still be happy. Uh, I think what matters is that they won now. They still have Matthew Stafford next year. They still have Cooper Cup. Aaron Donald if he doesn't retire. Uh, the only things that are leaving are OBJ and possibly Von Miller. It depends on if they decide to stay or not. But like I said, they won right now and they still have all these big pieces for next season. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, but I, I got to say that the Bengals, I think, um, have a chance to win multiple Super Bowls in the future. I mean, they have Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow, T. Higgins, just, just to name a few. All of those, those three guys that were drafted in the last two years for Cincinnati. And I mean, the impact that they've made is just astronomical. I mean, Joe Burrow got hurt last year with a season-ending ACL injury, and now he's back leading his team to the Super Bowl. So, I don't know. I think that Joe Burrow could be a franchise quarterback. I think Jamar Chase could be um, have, have a possibility to be a multiple MVP candidate um, offensively. And I don't know. I think Cincinnati has a chance to win – multiple Super Bowls in the future and like I get it they haven't won in the past like it stinks for them I, I really feel bad um, but they have a, they have a good opportunity while the Rams like have a lot of competition in the NFC and like will they be able to make it back if they lose those key pieces that you that you described yeah well like you said the NFC is really difficult but so is the AFC the Chiefs are always going to be one of the top teams so I don't really see what's stopping the Bengals, like the Bengals are going to have to play against the Chiefs. They're going to have to play against all these teams that are continuously good. We have the, uh, the Bills. They're up and coming with Josh Allen. So it's not just the NFC that has a tough race. And with next season, Matthew Stafford had an MVP college first season. We know Cooper Cup won Offensive Player of the Year. He'll be back. So all these main pieces that led the Rams to the Super Bowl this year, they're still going to be back next year. So I don't see what's stopping them from going back to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean... You're right. I mean, with Tom Brady retiring, possibly Aaron Rodgers leaving Green Bay, like there could be a chance for L.A., but it just seems a lot more difficult now, given the fact that obviously the 49ers won. If the Packers won that game, would the Rams have won in Lambeau? And I'm not saying that the Rams didn't deserve to win. I think that they did deserve to win this year. But will they get an opportunity at some of the matchups that they were able to get next year like they did this year? And with Cincinnati, I think it's the same. I think it's the same thing. Like I think, obviously they had to fight the, to win. I mean, they beat the Raiders barely. They had to beat the Titans on the road, and they 
the fact that they beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead might be the biggest green flag for me because if they're able to beat Kansas City, a team with an amazing fan base that can break records of being the loudest outdoor stadium, and they beat them on the road in the AFC Championship, an experienced team that has won a Super Bowl in their second year. Some of them, Jamar Chase's first year, he's a rookie. Like, what could stop them in the future years? They're only going to get better here. They're only going to figure out how to work as a team more next season and the seasons to come. Yeah, I, mean, I do agree with that. I think they definitely have a bright future, but nothing is guaranteed with their building style. They have a bright future ahead, but the Rams were guaranteed this year. They went all in for Von Miller, all in for Matthew Stafford, and that building style is what led them to the Super Bowl, and that's what caused them to win because Von Miller made a big impact in last night's game. Matthew Stafford, of course, made a big impact, and I just think that the building style of win now is the mindset that caused them to win. The Bengals may have a bright future, but you never know what could happen. There could all be injuries and things like that, but what happened with the Rams was they just went all in this year, and they just went straight to the Super Bowl and won it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the Bengals have, I guess now they have a chance to use some of the money that they haven't spent on players to spend on free agents and some, some other stars. And I think that's why their method of building a team that's good enough to go to the Super Bowl was better than the Rams because they drafted their stars. Now they have a chance to bring in some other stars from other teams, which is why I think that when it all comes down to it, just like the Chiefs and just like other teams that have been rebuilding for a while and are finally at the peak, peak condition, I think that they now have a chance to win for years to come while some of the other teams really don't. Like, what's going to happen with Tampa Bay? Um, like, they went all in to get Tom Brady, now he's retiring. Like, are they going to be back in the Super Bowl? I don't know. Like, they don't have any draft picks really coming up. So that's why I just think that the Bengals have um, just – a better way of getting to the Super Bowl, which was drafting. Yeah. Well, we're going to cut to a break, and when we get back, we're going to go to Jackson and Blake, who are previewing tonight's KU basketball game. You may not hear it at first, but it's there. Our chant, rising. On this summit, callings converge. Voices unify into a chorus sounds out for good, for greatness. Can you hear it? What's up, Take Aside fam? Blake Sevenbergen here, joined today by Jackson Reed. We are live inside of Allen Fieldhouse, where tonight at 8 o'clock, your Kansas Jayhawks will take on the 12-12 and -12 Oklahoma State Cowboys on ESPN in the Big Monday showdown. Big game for the Jayhawks, 33-0 and at home on Big Monday under Bill Self. Jackson, who's the most important for KU to continue that streak tonight? The most important player for this team has to be Ochai Baji. The guy's leading Kansas in points, leading them in almost every statistical category other than rebounds, obviously, Dave McCormick. But what I'm saying is Ochai Baji's a National Player of the Year nominee for a reason. He's this team's leading guy for a reason. He can put the ball in the hoop from anywhere on the floor, it feels like. Ochai Baji is definitely this team's most important player and the reason why they get a good chunk of their wins. And so my point being tonight, Ochai Baji is Kansas' most important player getting a W. Yeah, primetime guy. Och is a menace to society on the basketball court. He's fun to watch play basketball. But Och gets his every night. Och is always getting 20 points. I know he's struggled a little bit recently, but... It doesn't matter if Ochai is good or not. Like, that's how this team goes. But Ochai is good every night. So you tell me, like, if you give a supporting cast to Ochai, it doesn't matter how he plays. So that's why for me, I'm going with Zach Clements, a little bit of an underdog pick here. Zach has been out for, what, five weeks with a foot injury? Yeah, for a while. He practiced for the first time on Thursday last week and came in with nine minutes left against Oklahoma and didn't give up a point to the guy that he was guarding all day. Tanner Groves had 20 points at the time. It hit like four threes. You know, it was like a, it was a flashback to the NCAA tournament last year with Tanner Groves from, out, from outside. No one could stop him either. Zach comes in the game. Sure, he's not necessarily the best defender according to our standards right now. But throw him on the floor, and he holds that guy scoreless. He hits the biggest three of the game, and he gets the biggest rebound of the game late. Zach Clements off the bench is going to be the spark guy for this team tonight, I think. And he's, he's, he's the guy for me tonight. I love Zach Clements. Don't get me wrong. The problem with Zach Clements is his minutes. How many minutes is he going to get? Because he's playing the third big spot, maybe even the fourth big spot right now. Behind Mitch Lightfoot and Dave McCormick. 
No, I know he will. He will be behind Dave McCormick and Mitch Lightfoot. There's no reason to think that Zach Clemens would be the the second big after one three and one rebound. Don't get me wrong; it was very important. But we saw this with KJ Adams. We saw this with KJ Adams at with the Texas Tech game. We we're like, oh, KJ's minutes are going to skyrocket. KJ's minutes didn't skyrocket. <laughs> it's going to be the same situation with Zach Clements. And I love that about this Kansas team. This Kansas team is so deep; they can get production from anybody off the bench. And I literally mean anybody. Zach Clements was one of those guys in the Oklahoma game. Obviously, the reason why we won the game. But this isn't the Oklahoma game anymore. If Zach Clements' minutes go up significantly, which I expect them to go up a little bit, but, I mean, to expect him to get 10, 15 more minutes is ridiculous. Yeah, I'm not saying 10, 15 more minutes, but he was the only guy on the, off the bench that scored on Saturday. His three was the only bench player that scored on Saturday. He was our most consistent big man late in the second half. He was playing over two seniors on this team and making – great use of his time I know we talked about KJ and how you know he had signs of getting to play a lot of minutes but you think about it Zach can stretch the floor you add that offense with a big man that can shoot the three and get you rebounds and lock down a guy on defense sign me up for Zach Clements all day long I really hope Zach Clements has a big game I just don't think he will be the reason that we get the win tonight and maybe you know we get a, we get ahead 10 11 points and Bill will throw him in and see what happens or try different lineups and see what happens cuz I personally love when Joe Yesifu and Zach Clements are on the floor at the same time it gives us so much more athleticism combined with the perimeter shooting that Clements provides and you're right he stretches the floor he's probably the best big that we have in regards to doing that and I mean the great thing, like I said, about this Kansas team is they're so deep and they have so many bigs that can do different things. Dave is a great post scorer and a great rebounder. Mitch can provide athleticism and he can shoot a little bit. KJ, one of the better rebounders we've had here at Kansas in a long time. And Zach Clements obviously can stretch the floor and he moves very well for a guy that's his size. So I understand the argument here, but I'm telling you right now, Ochai Baji is the reason Kansas is ranked sixth in the country right now. They're the reason that they're in this position to play in a big game like this. Ochai Baji is the, the reason Kansas will get a win tonight. Yeah, so with that being said, you said the reason Kansas gets a win tonight. What do you think the final score ends up being? I think Kansas will get the win. The final score is going to be 78-63. Kansas is going to take it by 15 tonight. Give me Kansas by 15 as well, but I'm going 80-65. There you go, guys. We appreciate you tuning in with us, and back to everybody in the studio. Thanks, Blake and Jackson. Looking forward to watching the game tonight. Another player to watch for is Jalen Wilson, who has really emerged these past few weeks as a reliable scorer and an excellent rebounder as he continues to improve as we move into mid-February of the basketball season. But we are going to be, take a quick break. When we get back, we will be discussing some blockbuster NBA trades before the deadline. We'll see you in a little bit. Where you go to college makes a statement about you. This place will become a part of you your identity for life. The University of Kansas, a great place to be you. A lot of our waste ends up discarded in the environment causing pollution, but we can help to reduce this pollution by recycling. There are many recycling bins on KU's campus. And when you're not on campus, take advantage of these bins offered in many retail stores. You should also try to reduce your use of plastic by using these refillable water jugs. Our actions have a huge impact on the environment, so make sure to do your part to keep it clean. For our third and final debate, I am joined by Isabel Scarborough and Matt Minier to discuss which team got the better deal before the trade deadline. The Brooklyn Nets and Philadelphia 76ers made a swap for James Harden and Ben Simmons, along with the Nets getting a few draft picks with that. And along with that big trade, the Dallas Mavericks also traded Kristaps Porzingis to the Washington Wizards. Isabel, which one of these teams won the trade deadline? The clear team that won before the trade deadline was the 76ers without a beat. They got James Harden and Paul Millsap, but James Harden alone is enough to win and get an A+. Plus. James Harden is one of the best guards in the NBA, and he's now on a team he wants to play for. So that alone, he's going to be stout when he finally gets to play. I think when you look at the team that got better, I think you have to go with the Brooklyn Nets. They already have Katie, and they already have Kyrie. And then adding Ben Simmons, who is one of the best defenders in the league and is also a great playmaker, adding that. And then plus Seth Curry, who is a great shooter. He's not as good as his brother, but he's still very good. 
and then they uh, bolstered their front court, adding Andre and Drummond. I think you just look at this, which team got better. I think it's obviously the Brooklyn Nets. And with Harden going to the Sixers, how do you know he can stay loyal to this team? He's already been – this is his third team in three years. How do you know How do you know he might not want to leave next year? Ben Simmons was a good trade to the Nets, but he hasn't been playing that much. So, in theory, he's a great – He's a great trade, but right now with him not being on the court that much, he can't be good right now because he can't really emphasize with the team that he should be playing on. But of course, now you have James Harden and Embiid together. Those two are two powerhouses. They're two super big names that are going to be on the same court together. So you add both of them with their different skills, and they're going to combine. I think one of the problems is, though, they're both, they, both, uh, they both want the ball. So it's going to be hard trying to figure out you know, who's going to be that number one scorer and Embiid's having an amazing year, and is hard, Harden might take away from some of that. So I think, and um, I think that may be a problem there. And back to what I said uh, about Harden, uh, his third team in three years. I don't know if uh, if he's gonna be loyal to this team. It's gonna be hard to, uh, with all the, with uh, Joel and B big egos. I think it's gonna be hard to see um, if he will, how he how he will do, and it might uh, might affect his future. Now, of course, you can't forget Paul Millsap because he was also one of the trades that the 76ers get. And he can be a big man when they need to have a big man. So now you have all these big names on a team, which, of course, it can be a little difficult because a bunch of big names can kind of butt heads and everything. But they're all good players. So I feel like they'll all take the skills they have and be able to combine them more than get rid of it and make it be less. For them. Yeah, I really think – I don't think neither team lost the trade. I think both teams got really good assets out of it. But I want to uh, switch sides. Who do you think uh, are some teams that maybe lost the trade deadline? If you didn't make any moves. I feel like the Lakers, they had so much potential in what they could have done. And I feel like they had to do it more. The Lakers, they've been kind of on a, a down, an if. They've been losing games. LeBron has kind of been hurt. You have Westbrook, who's been a little on the sideline, on the bench, when they all need to be on the court. And I feel like the Lakers should have made trades when they could have made trades. Yeah, I agree. Um, LA, they should have made a move for maybe even some younger guys just to – Maybe give their because they really have no future. Let's be honest. They all got basically the LA retirement home. Basically, it's um they got a bunch of oldies, and I don't think I know they're trying to win now with LeBron because he's getting older. But I think they still maybe should have added maybe a few younger pieces to just maybe maybe bolster the chances because they most likely will make the playoffs in the play-in because the what the bottom of the West is not very good. But another team I want to move into the East, I think is the Bulls, who should have made a move at this deadline. Um, they've had a lot of injuries this year. Lonzo Ball, Zach Levine, Alex Caruso. I think Lonzo Ball and Al uh, Caruso have both have been out for a few weeks now, and they are a big part of that team. They're one of the best def defenders in the league, and I think losing those guys for a period of time has really hurt their hurt their um, their standings. I think they, they were first a few weeks ago, about a month ago. They were first in the Eastern Conference for a while, and now they're starting to slip. And I think maybe if they would have made a deal maybe for a big man or maybe for a defender. Because right now, they really have no depth at the forward position. You have Pat Williams, who's been out since the beginning of the year with a wrist injury. And he, right now, he's projected to come back towards the end of the season. But he was one of their best defenders, even as a second-year player. So I think maybe if they could have added maybe a defender just to give them a little more depth or maybe just a big man, I think it would have helped them a lot in their chances. Because they already got a stack. They already got to deal with the – the Nets, the um, the Sixers, and the Bucks, and even the Heat, and I don't think right now they can hang with those guys like Embiid and Anacumpo. Um, I don't think anybody can guard them right now. So adding a big, maybe a big man would have really helped their chances. I believe. I agree with that 100. percent I feel like both of like the Lakers and the Bulls, they're both in the, the same area of they could have made a bunch of things to make their team better. There were so many trades that happened, and they could have done it, and they should have done it. But, of course, still, after all this, the 76ers, I feel like, won the trade deadline. Do you have anything else you would like to say? I'm just going to say, we'll see what happens. Maybe they'll play, play in the playoffs. Hopefully, they'll play in the playoffs. It'll be a great series, and that'll be one for the, for the history books. It'll be awesome to see. But with that, uh, we'll send it back to Max. Thank you so much for tuning in for today's show. Before we go, be sure to create your own cited account to be able to post debates of your own, as well as to comment and vote on others' debates. Along with that, follow us on Instagram at TakeAsideKU for weekly live streams and clips from the show. Also, our Twitter is also at TakeAsideKU, where we'll be having some different sided content for you weekly. That is all the time we have for today. For all of us here at Take Aside, we'll see you next week.